Ireland. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Bruce Yale today. Um, his brief bio background for him, on him. He moved to Oregon because of his various health problems. He needed to get into a clean, more consistent environment and temperature, also to possibly take advantage of Oregon's death with dignity near the end of his life. After studying the law, he realized he probably would never qualify. Therefore, he started the nonprofit End Choices and to get Oregon Death with Dignity Law expanded to be more compassionate. So, please welcome Bruce to give us more information about that. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, I suffer from that um, dreaded disease nervousness. <laughs> Also, behind every man that thinks he has a good idea is a woman that makes it happen. <laughs> this is my wife, Kathleen. <laughs> One of the problems I have is, is, is I can't multitask anymore too much. i got to concentrate on what I'm trying to do, so I can't work my PowerPoint and my talking at the same time. So we're going to keep the PowerPoint going. Um, that's okay. May I offer something? Yes. This screen will not seemingly not talk, in my experience, any other computer but the full computer. Just letting you know. Yeah, no, we had it up. So anyway, once I discovered, once I realized that this wasn't going to work for a whole lot of people, um, I decided to um, do something about it. Uh, I wrote a letter to the editor of the Eugene newspaper. He, uh, they, someone saw it at the Oregon um, University. They had a senior journalism class designed every year to do a project on an uh, interesting person in the Pacific Northwest. They read my letter and said, this is a little bit different, so they got a hold of me. They came out and they spent uh, a few days with me, following me around, and they made a really nice documentary on me. Um, and they actually ended up getting a nationwide uh, second in the college Emmys with it. Wow. So, anyway. Okay, from there, I had such people saying, coming and saying, this needs done, it needs done, and thank you, so on. So I took a little paragraph of what I would like to see, and I went to our Senator, Arnie Roblin. I would given myself five to ten years to eventually get this on the ballot and go through the uh, process of getting the uh, petition signed. Uh, Arnie Roblin said to me, he says, I have enough bills in 2019, I will sponsor it for you. So right there, cut, oh, maybe ten years out of my goal. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I, I decided I needed to educate Oregonians on the restrictions and the possibilities of expansions. So I had a Babe Ruth autograph and I sold it. Uh -huh. And I financed this for the first uh, five months, six months, well actually for the last year. I have been getting some donations and um, we are saving those for media, like I just bought a quarter page ad and the Oregonian will come up this morning and tomorrow morning, quarter page ads. Okay, we'll get some facts to just show you why this is going to be necessary. 37 maybe million baby boomers will turn 65 over the next decade, bringing the percentage of people age 65 or older to 20% or more than 71 million people. So I know that's going to take a while for some of us to get to 65, but there we go. <laughs> The life expectancy for the baby boomers over the past generations, because we have a higher chronic diseases, more disability, and lower rated health than members of the previous generations, we have a longer life expectancy. Uh, I think because of the um, keeping the people alive and the chronic diseases, I believe are environmentally caused. I think my Parkinson's was caused by uh, breathing chemicals when I was working in agriculture so much. Yes. 
This one's kind of started. 42% of the people who live to age 70 will spend time in a nursing home before they die. One half of them for two years or more. Today, one in nine people, that's one out of every nine of us in this room, according to the Alzheimer's Association, has Alzheimer's, rather we've been diagnosed or not. By the year 2050, they figure 21% of all people over 65 will have Alzheimer's. This is just Alzheimer's. This isn't your Lewy body dementias, any of your other dementia-related diseases, your neurological diseases, your cancers. Any of those diseases are going to cripple you and make you have a, uh, a suffering at your end of life. So that's a pretty, pretty big fact for just Alzheimer's. 13.8 million just Alzheimer's by 2050. So we are definitely going to hit a healthcare system that can't handle it now, and it's not going to handle it then. 60 to 70 percent of our nursing home residents now have dementia-related systems, symptoms. The conservative estimate an elder should be prepared to spend 150,000 in cost to cover the small but real potential that he or she will spend two or three years in the facility nursing homes. And you saw the statistics of all of us over 65 that will probably be there. This kind of speaks for itself. This is why we're doing this. Suicide, you're going to hear from the uh, opposition, and you'll hear a lot about them in a little while, but they, people always say, well, you're, you're promoting suicide. These associations, and many more since we did make this, there's been a lot of changes since we did make our PowerPoint. Um, we couldn't keep up with all of them. But these, American Academy of Neurology, Family Physicians Association, American Association of Suicidology, and American Academy of Physicians all realize that there's a difference between suicide and medical aid in dying. So this is becoming quite a, um, I'm going to say popular because I can't figure out another word to say, action and motion across the United States. There are now nine states that have our restricted law. And they're looking at pushing it, uh, I think there are two or more that have it in their bills right now. <coughs> what is the current law? The current law is restricted. You basically have to be almost dead anyway. You have to have two doctors tell you. <laughs> Would you please not do that? <laughs> you have to have two docs, doctors tell you that you have only six months to live. Now that's pretty limited. Yeah. Plus, you have to have a sound mind. You saw, you saw the amount of people 65 and over that are just going to have Alzheimer's. How many of us are going to have a sound mind when they tell us we only have six months to live to be able to ask for a compassionate end of life? Not a lot of us according to the statistics. The options are coming up. We believe everybody needs to have a choice. I have people that tell me I want to lay in bed with tubes in me till I take my last breath. That's their choice. It's all about individual rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And that happiness and pursuit of life should be your quality of life and choice right up to when you need to end it. Okay, our bills. House Bill 2232. Well, I'll give you a little... Um, after I went to Arnie Roblin, I went to two or three other representatives, House of Representatives, <coughs> and other senators. And I talked with them, and between them, I have gotten four bills that came up this year. So um, two of the ones, the, the, the 2217, which you'll hear about, which I want to testify for, is included <coughs> in these, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. But we're going to redefine terminal disease as a disease that will produce or substantially contribute to a patient's death. A 
allows the patient to request the medication as soon as 90 days after diagnosis or immediately if only given six months to live. So what this means is, when I get my diagnosis of uh, uh, early dementia, I don't want to take the chance of living in, in, in a state or even going to the point where my dementia advances enough that they decide I can't make my own choices. And that does happen. So when they diagnose me, and even with my Parkinson's this would work if I was to feel like it. They diagnose me, two doctors, I have to wait 90 days and then I can request medical aid and die. Okay, if you only have diagnosed with only 90 days, six months, whatever, you can do it right away. You don't have to have a waiting period right now when you ask for your medication. You have to have a two week waiting period to get it. That's gonna be gone because you might be gone in two weeks with some of these diagnoses. Twenty nine zero three also deletes the six months. It's going to expand terminal disease to include a degenerative condition that will, at some point in the future, be the cause of the patient's death. This will also create a death with dignity advisory committee with the Oregon Health Authority to advise the director on the development and administration of death with dignity policies and practices. This, I feel, is very important because one of the questions I always get is, who's going to make these decisions? I always felt there should be a committee because not one person, two, two people can make the decisions to make changes in these laws. Um, so I, I like the committee thing. Uh, one of the reasons that the expanded, uh, mentioned uh, terminal disease, a degenerative condition, is because earlier this year, we had a young woman named Brittany Olofsson, who was 27 years old. The woman started having seizures in the womb. She had a rare genetic form of epilepsy that did not allow any treatment. She <laughs> suffered immensely. They have films of her rolling on the floor, biting her tongue, but I, I'm not going to go any further. But anyway, so her mother and her twin sister asked the doctor because Beth, Brittany did, want, did not want to be a, de a dependent. She didn't want to be a burden. 27 years old, she says, I've had enough. They asked the doctor, can we take advantage of our death with dignity law? No doctor's going to tell you with epilepsy, you only got six months to live. She shot herself. She shot herself in the chest because she wanted to preserve her brain for science. Her mother came in and found her gasping on the floor, saying, I'm sorry. No mother should have to go through that. No mother should have to go through that. So that's why this one came up on conditions, uh, degenerative conditions, because this includes people that may be uh, quads, paraplegics, anything, any condition <coughs> that you don't want to suffer your life better, where your choice of your quality control is dropped enough, we really want you to have access to medical aid and dying. Okay, 2217. This bill came up last week, two weeks ago, for a hearing. This bill, what it does is people, right now, you have to be able to swallow your medicine. Some people can't move their arms to their mouth. Some people ALS, Parkinson's <clears throat> near the end. I may not be able to swallow. So I can't, there are people now that can take advantage of this death with dignity bomb, but they can't get the medicine to their mouths or swallow it if they get it there. So what this does is this lets the doctor set up an intravenous system. It's called a double valve in, uh, infusion pump where a part Paraplegic, all he has to do is twitch, and it will send infusion of medicine into their, into their system. Uh, Canada has this, 80% um, of Canada's patients decide to have it intravenous. So um, that's all we are asking for with our 2217. 2217, those same methods are also <coughs> included in the 2903 and in the 2232. So we didn't feel it was real important to show up for this bill because they were in the real bills that we wanted. I showed up, I was the only person there testifying for the bill. I was also the only handicapped person testifying, the only disabled, excuse me. Mm -hmm. The only disabled person testifying. Testifying against me was all healthy people. Mm -hmm. ah. They all made money keeping people alive, working in memory care units, or 
this is the one that's going to get you. There were two organizations there, one named Compassionate Choices, who originally got our law. They worked with another group called Death with Dignity National. Their goal is to get every state in the United States having our restrictive law. Oh. They came up and they are opposing us because they're afraid that these other states where their efforts are being opposed are going to point at us and say we can't make up our mind and they're changing their laws already. So they're, you know, they think it's going to affect their efforts in other states. So they're, they're hanging us out to dry. Mm. They're taking our senior rights away, disabled rights away, because they're worried about people in Nevada, people in New Jersey. And so they're, they're actually testifying against us being more compassionate. We, I read the steps of the courthouse for Monday morning. My ad's in the Oregonian about a rally we are having Monday morning. We are going to let the legislators know they need to talk to their, listen to their constituents instead of these outside interests. I have been in contact with Compassion and Choices. I tried to get them to work with me in the very beginning. They wouldn't even contact with me because they told, what I had an article in the Washington Post also about me. They've told every journalist and radio man that's talked to them that they oppose Oregon changing any of their laws. And yet their upper ups, when you talk to them, say, we don't oppose it, we just don't support it. <laughs> because like I said, it's affecting their work in other states. Right, so what I told them, and I, they're kind of upset because I'm putting on a protest, and they've been trying to work with me, and they said maybe we should work on some language, and I said maybe we should over a year and a half ago when, you'd asked, when, when I approached you about doing this. I emailed them, talked to four different people for six months, they would find out who I was and cut off communication. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to soften up, please don't protest against us. And I said, I'm not protesting against you, I'm protesting against our legislators listening to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, the Senate bill, we do have one Senate bill. Those others are House bills. This will create the exception under the death with dignity to 15 days waiting period for patients with less than 15 days to live. It creates exception to the two day waiting period for patients with less than two days to live. That's what I was saying earlier about when you get a diagnosis of we're gonna end it and you don't have to have any waiting periods, which is kind of dumb to have for a person that only has two weeks to live anyway. control our medical issues. Nobody wants to feel pain. I found that the biggest thing is, and when people do oppose me, I think the question I leave everybody with is, do you want to live with dementia? Do you want to take the chance of having to live in a demented state? I know I don't. I'm a big boy. I have many health problems, brain lesions being a couple of them. So I'm aggressive, as you can see. Um, and I have seen what they do with people like me in the memory care units. I'll be drugged up and tied down. I don't want to be happily incarcerated, which they say I see a lot of happily people in there, yes. A lot of happy people in there. I have a friend's sister that happily uses her excrement for wall art. <laughs> Not a chance I want to take. So, you know, these, these are things, and like I said, 99.8% of the people I ask, do you want to live with dementia? I have a best friend that says, I don't care, I won't be there. <laughs> Mentally, he won't be there. But when you go into these memory care units, you look, there is really no one that is happy all the time, and they do know they're there. Anxiety, depression, uh, it, it's all there. In the evenings, it's terrible. It, it, it just, it's ugly. I don't know if any of you have been in these memory care units, but uh, the anxiety that it goes on in them, the people's always out to get them, the paranoia. It's just somewhere I didn't want to uh, approach for myself. Okay, we're going to do something that I don't do in the public. I'm going to talk about my beliefs and some of my opposings to the um, religious angle of the medical aid and dying. When I do hear from the Catholics about the suicide, what happened was I went to a funeral a few years ago for a man that was very old, not very <coughs> old, but in his 60s, he was always in the Catholic Church, did work for him, he was high up in the Catholic Church, killed himself from depression. The 
Catholic Church buried him with full mass in the Catholic cemetery. So I started thinking, how is this? The past even says he's going to heaven. As Catholics, we all learned it was suicide when we studied it. So I started looking around. Came up, the catechism. Catechisms are the teachings of the Catholic religion. 2282-2282. Grave psychological disturbances, anguish, or grave fear of hardship, suffering, or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide. We should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives by ways known to him alone. God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. Tells it like it is for the Catholics. There's also two months ago on the Online Catholic Digest, they came out and they did say that we are softening, we're turning this way to realize medical aid and dying is different than a suicide. It's caused from emotions or something like that. <clears throat> when someone's really concerned because of their belief and they're Christian, they are Catholic, to me, Romans covers everything. If you've been a Christian, Roman tells you, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. It goes on and it tells you even if you can be possessed by, the, by, a, by a spirit, you can go on. I, I'm not going to go on to that because I don't know. <laughs> um, my belief is, in, in, in the, in the, about God, is that... Um, a little bit different. I, I think I've become a spiritualist from coming in here. I've always felt that I was my own God. I felt that I was my own higher, higher being that I answered to. And I also have always had a, a guardian angel. So it's like, I'm not going to tell you there's not a God, but I'm not sure there is. So my feeling is the Bible is written by men who read Ten Commandments. One person had Ten Commandments. Those were the original Bible to me. That's true. The rest were all interpretations. All interpretations of what they think God meant. Okay, we had the Old Testament. It was a little bit rough. As, <laughs> <laughs> as, 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 as life proceeded and things progressed, we got the New Testament. Softened things up a bit because it had to because of the progression of the uh, population that's doing this. My thinking is that another 100 years they're going to have the next testament. Because I really believe if God had thought that they were going to make people suffer, keeping them alive for the sake of money, he would have addressed it. In the old days, Your life expectancy, especially around the time the Bible was written, you know, you hit 10, 12, 20, you, hit, you were old, you um, got a disease, you dropped off. Yeah. Up until the progression of modern science where they came up with these methods to make us keep living, our lifeline went pretty much there, you got sick, you went down. Okay? Now, after the 1940s where they started coming up with all this stuff to keep us alive and stuff, we get sick, we go down, we get fixed, we go up. We get sick, we go down, we get fixed, we go up. Now that's my Parkinson's working here. Uh -huh. But you can get the idea. It just goes like that right to the end of your life. They keep bringing you down, they keep bringing you up to be healthy. Or what they think is healthy. It's, it's their idea of a good quality of life when they think that you're getting a little bit fixed because they don't have any <coughs> your symptoms. I hear from, I went out and I spent uh, about a half an hour last week with the um, father out here at the Catholic Church. Talking about this, telling him how I feel. Um, uh, he says to me, he said, I feel my feeling is life is a gift from God. I said, I believe that totally. You know, when I believe in God, I believe life is a gift from God. 
But I also believe when I had my heart attack, God said, your life's over. He stopped my heart for a purpose because God decided that was it with me. And then this man comes in playing God. And he starts my heart again. Mm -hmm. And then they take me to a building where a lot of people are playing God and making money keeping me alive. So he said to me, um, I understand all this. I can see it. He says, I am not a Bible literist. He says, my feeling is suffering is part of the gift from God. Can't argue with that one, but that's his choice, I told him. I said, that's a choice. It's all we're asking for is people to have these choices. So we need help. Monday night is our deadline. What happened was because of the opposition to 2217, so much people opposing it and only me for it, they decided not to even bring the other two bills up to a hearing. Oh. So I went last Tuesday. I wrote a letter kind of a little bit threatening that you're going to get these disabled people because we cannot mobilize. We can't get there in quick. I said, but if I need to, I'll bring some people in. We'll get on your steps with disabled people and, and, and show you what we're for, you know. So that letter, um, 2217 had a hearing. A lot of people opposing it. It was dead. And I went up and talked to him. Everybody said, no, it's dead. We aren't going to hear those other two. So I wrote this letter, I went around to every person on the House uh, Health Care Committee, and I handed it to them, and I said, look, we're going to be here every year until this gets done. So you're going to see my ugly face every year. You saw it last year. Last year when I testified, it was the same thing. A bunch of suits from out of state testifying against it. One disabled individual testifying for a bill about the disabled. So, Monday, we are holding a rally on the steps. I know it's tough to get there, but I would request everybody pick up one of my cards, get on our website, and email the Andrea Salinas, who is the head of the House Health Care Committee, and tell her you want Bills 2232 and 2903 to at least be heard. When I rattled the trees last Tuesday, they have decided they sent me an email on Thursday, saying that they have now scheduled 2217 for a workshop. So maybe I rattled enough pages and they're starting to listen that, hey, we need to listen to our disabled, not to these other people. So Anyway, I got my cards and stuff, information about us back here. Please pick it up, go to our website, look at the stuff, Facebook, look at the stuff. It'll have a... Uh, um, Connections to Andrea so you can give her your support and tell her, you know, the thing is What I like people to say is we're, we are the elder. We are a little bit older We are a little disabled and we cannot make these things or we would be there because they tell you all of a sudden I get an email saying your hearing is up in two days How am I going to mobilize a lot of the Disabled people and the elderly to get there for something like that. It's just not fair to us. So, um, like I say, it's, it's, we need to let them know they need to listen to their constituents. And uh, hopefully we can get this done. We know that we have to really worry about having to live with dementia. Thank you. Yeah.